Hi everyone. In a previous video, I mentioned that the atmosphere blurs stars, making them bigger than one pixel. Stars are so far away that their angular size is really tiny. The farther away something is, the smaller it appears to us. So without an atmosphere to bend starlight, why are Hubble stars bigger than one pixel? Welcome to Deep Sky Detail. On Earth, when you leave the shutter on while capturing deep sky objects, the atmosphere blurs the photons across the sensor. Kind of what is happening here. But the Hubble Space Telescope doesn't have to deal with most of our atmosphere. Let's zoom in to this image of the Pillars of Creation for a minute that Hubble took. All of these stars have diameters bigger than a pixel. I was curious about this. I had an inkling of what was going on, but I wanted to learn more. So after hours and hours of thinking about it, I came up with an answer. And that answer was, I really didn't know. It turns out that just thinking about things can be really dumb. And the way to get smarter is to read and do some homework and to study. So that's what I did for several more hours. And here are some of the things that I found out. By the end of this video, I hope to get across how diffraction, point spread functions, and plane waves are related. Okay, so here is a diagram of a telescope. Light enters the front, bounces off the primary mirror, then off the secondary mirror, and then goes into the sensor. Let's say that we're taking an image of the Horsehead Nebula. This red light represents the top of the horse head, and the bottom light shows the bottom of the horse head. As you can see, light from the top and bottom hit different parts of the sensor. We can resolve some detail from the horse head because the pixels are gathering light from that area of the sky and recording it. But how much detail can we see? Is this small patch of dark nebula resolvable when you don't have to deal with the atmosphere? That answer is, interestingly enough, related to why Hubble stars are bigger than one pixel. So let's just consider these rays from the nebula to keep things simple. Now let's add Alnitag in yellow to this diagram. Like the nebula, it is emitting rays in all directions, and all the light captured by the telescope's primary mirror gets reflected onto the sensor. It should only be focused on one spot of the sensor, and when I say should, I mean absolutely shouldn't. The reason is diffraction from the telescope aperture, among other things. So let's consider monochromatic rays that are coming into Hubble from Alnitak for a second. The waves from Alnitak are almost perfect plane waves from Hubble's perspective, meaning they are in phase with each other. The, the peaks or the crests line up. They're parallel to each other, and it seems like they keep going in infinite directions. It's so pretty. But something happens when the waves enter Hubble's aperture. To understand that, we have to understand the Huygens-Fresnel principle. <laughs> Sorry, I butchered those names. For plane waves, where the crests line up, this is called the wavefront. This principle says that any point on the wavefront can be treated as its own little teeny tiny wave that spreads out in all directions. These are wavelets. Most of that spreading out goes in a forward direction, and all the other wavelets mostly cancel each other out except for the forward movement. All those forward moving wavelets then create the next wavefront and the process continues. But what happens when there is a lens and a plane wave hits it? Let's look at what is happening to the wavelets on the sides of the lens. Only part of the wavelets are going through. The plane wave has been disrupted. It is no longer infinite. Remember how I said that most of the wavelets cancel each other out except in the forward direction? That's no longer true, and the wave starts interfering with each other as, as well as diffracting, or the light is bending. 
for a circular lens, we get circular interference and circular bending. That interference pattern looks like this. Instead of a single dot, you get a blurred out circle and concentric rings around it. This is called the airy disk, named after the mathematician who developed theories around it. Sir George Biddle, airy. The interference pattern and amount of bending will depend on a couple of things. First, the wavelength of light. Here you can see that not all the colors have the same interference pattern. It will also depend on the size of the aperture. Larger telescopes have a smaller airy disk. This means that larger apertures have higher resolution. You can zoom in to two small objects without the airy disk from one interfering with the blurry disk of the other. Let's look at this Hubble image again. You can see on this star concentric rings around it. Interesting. It's even clearer in this image of a star taken from a Celestron Edge HD since it doesn't have diffraction spikes from spider veins. Let's see if we can model the central portion of the airy disk in R. Let's create a kernel that shows how light will spread out from the point source. It's based on a 3D Gaussian distribution. Here is the code I used, and here is what the plot looks like. Does it look familiar? Well, it should. It's a point spread function, meaning it shows how a point source of light will spread out. Astrophotographers use it all the time to assess the quality of their guiding or in deconvolution when they're processing their images. They'll usually refer to a star's full width half maximum, which is proportional to the standard deviation of the point spread function. It tells how much a point source of light spreads out through the diffraction and other effects, like the atmosphere. Let's take a look at this in 3D for fun. Here's the code I use for that. And here is the 3D graph. It looks nice. Well, let's make it pretty by adding some color. Nice. You can think of the height of this graph as the intensity of the light. It is a function of pixel coordinates x and y. It follows a Gaussian distribution where most of the light hits the center where the point source should be and falls off the farther away it gets from the center. Pretty cool. And here is a simple image that shows single white pixels on a black background. Let's convolve this with the point spread function. And the resulting image shows something that looks like blurry stars. Nice. Well, I think that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Like if you liked the video. Subscribe if you want to subscribe. See you next time.